Hello, I'm Patrick Shaw Stewart. I've put this talk together because I found myself in the strange position of coming up with what I'm convinced are the answers to some very important questions in medical biology, including answers that are relevant to the COVID epidemic. This talk is mainly about the experiments that we need to run. So I've been working on the problem of why virtually all respiratory viruses, but not other viruses, have winter seasonality. That's to say they make us sick more often in the winter than in the summer. And it's very interesting that the answers can also shed light on why some respiratory viruses are so much more pathogenic than others. My hypothesis, called temperature-dependent viral tropism, is based on the observation that there's a temperature gradient from the nose to the lungs and that the nose and throat are some of the coldest parts of the body. I suggest that virtually all respiratory viruses use temperature-driven switches that operate between around 33 to 37 degrees centigrade to avoid infecting the lungs, heart, brain, etc., because infections of those organs would immobilize their host. They normally replicate only below normal body temperature. Replicating in the nose and throat also allows the virus to be spread by speaking, sneezing, coughing, and runny noses. And I suggest that winter seasonality is a side effect of this. When the temperature drops in the fall, these viruses will become more active. When it rises in spring, they become less active. The hypothesis predicts that less temperature-sensitive strains are more likely to move down and infect the warmer lungs, so these strains are likely to be more virulent. Now, there's so much circumstantial evidence for this analysis that there is, in my opinion, no plausible alternative. So here's an example showing respiratory virus seasonality. This data comes from Buenos Aires, which has a subtropical climate, but there are many other examples that I could have shown you. The data shows hospitalizations of children from respiratory illness, and you can see very clearly here that when the temperature falls, the number of hospitalizations due to all these different viral species increases. This winter seasonality applies to virtually all respiratory diseases, even diseases caused by completely unrelated species. There's just one exception that I know of but it doesn't apply to other viral diseases such as polio and rabies, which are spread by other routes and often have summer seasonality. Now, I'm going to survey some of the important observational evidence, including, a little bit later on, some new results from New York City that are really game-changing. The first thing to say is that although viral illnesses virtually disappear in the summer in temperate regions, the same viruses thrive throughout the year in the tropics. Here you can see that influenza is common throughout the year in Singapore, but not in the USA and Australia in the summer. So this is strange. Wind and rain aren't strongly correlated with these illnesses in temperate regions. But in the tropics, wind and rain are correlated with respiratory illness. For example, this spike of flu in Singapore coincides with the southeastern monsoon, and this one with the northwestern monsoon. And here in Fortaleza, which is in northern Brazil, Flu and other respiratory illnesses occur during the rainy season. I'm showing rainfall here. Now I come to the very important new data that was published last year, in 2019, by a group at Columbia University in New York City. First, they found that respiratory viruses are very often present without causing symptoms. Influenza and human metanumovirus were asymptomatic in 30 to 50% of individuals who were carrying them but the other viruses were asymptomatic in two-thirds to three-quarters of cases where the virus was present. Secondly, they showed that as many people were carrying the virus in summer as in winter. So this means that we should change the way that we think about respiratory illness. First, that we shouldn't focus on mechanisms that change the rate of transmission in different seasons, because, as far as we know, transmission is just as efficient in summer and winter. Second, we need to look for mechanisms that can cause viruses that are already present to become more active. So what factor or factors might cause a dormant virus to become active? Well, in temperate regions, part of the answer is very clear, weather. But activity is not related to wind, rain, snow, sunshine, pressure or humidity. In almost all studies in temperate regions, Increased respiratory illness is strongly correlated with drops in temperature. So, for example, here is some data from a huge survey of the Netherlands that took place in 
The dotted and solid black and white lines show the number of people who had colds and flu in seven regions of the country. I've added the coloured lines above. These show the ambient temperature recorded in five weather stations that were dotted around the country. And I've plotted temperature inverted, that's to say high temperature is at the bottom of the graph and low temperature at the top. You can see that there was an extraordinary response to temperature drops. When the temperature fell, people all over the country had more colds and flu. And the response was too fast to be caused by changes in transmission. In the first half of the cold season, in other words up to the red line, epidemics were synchronised, sometimes to within one week, all over the country. So there seems to be a harvesting mechanism. Just as the Columbia studies showed, the virus was already present, but it was asymptomatic. When the temperature dropped, the dormant viruses became more active and there were dramatic increases in the number of colds. So what does this look like at the individual level? Well, another observational study can shed light here. A paper published in 1997 by the Euro Winter Group used market research techniques to look at the factors that increased the chance of dying of a respiratory illness in seven regions of Europe from northern Finland to Athens. They found that standing still outside, p equals 0.04, and shivering outside, p equals 0.001, were correlated with an increased chance of death. However, outdoor exercise sufficient to cause sweating and wearing an anorak both seem to be protective, both p equals 0.001. Now, if respiratory viruses really were made more active by temperature drops, as I suggest, it would be strange if this hadn't been noticed in biochemistry labs. This effect has, in fact, been seen in the lab. This is in spite of the fact that many labs work with influenza strains that have been propagated in other labs for years, and in some cases decades, at 37 degrees. So they're likely to have lost a lot of their natural temperature sensitivity. However, there is still a lot of evidence for temperature sensitivity at the biochemical level. Now, I haven't got time to show you all of the evidence, but here's an interesting example. These three different studies showed that in seven different strains of influenza, including bird flu, when the temperature dropped from around 37 degrees to 33, the virus dramatically switched from making protein to making new genetic material, which is RNA in the case of influenza. Now, other explanations for viral seasonality have been proposed. Two popular explanations are that we crowd together more in winter and that respiratory viruses can survive for longer outside the body in winter. The data from Columbia University and the example from the Netherlands suggest that these are not the main drivers of seasonality. But note that I'm not saying they have no effect on the progress of epidemics. I'm just saying that they're not the main drivers of the extraordinary winter seasonality of virtually all respiratory viruses. I think the evidence suggests that the natural temperature sensitivity of virtually all respiratory viruses is the main driver, with a smaller contribution from changes in our immune defences during winter and when we're chilled. This is all discussed in detail in my blog and review, which you can find in the links below this video. Most of this evidence comes either from observational studies or it's experimental data that was collected by accident when scientists were looking at something else. So what experiments are needed to really understand what's going on? Well, the problem could be tackled at many different levels. For a start, the observations of the Eurowinter group could be tested with randomised controlled studies to find out, let's say, whether going outdoors, warmly dressed, can reduce the chance of contracting a respiratory illness and dying. Focusing down to the virus, some of the most interesting and important experiments would obviously be in the wet lab. Within a few weeks, we could easily identify the temperatures that were most effective for isolating COV-2 and other respiratory viruses in tissue cultures. The literature reports that some respiratory viruses are easier to isolate at 37 degrees centigrade, but many others are easier to isolate at around 33. It would be very interesting to systematically find the optimal temperatures for isolating COV-2 and other respiratory viruses. In the medium term, the effect of temperature on coronavirus and a variety of other viruses could be investigated in the lab on a step-by-step -step basis. The experiments that I showed you earlier looked only at the switch between making protein and making viral RNA. However, there are many other critical steps in the life cycle of a virus, any one of which could be temperature sensitive. For example, we could look at the effect of temperature 
on the entry of the virus into the cell, making the first viral proteins, making new copies of the virus's genetic material, assembly of new virions, and the exit of virions from the cell or cell surface. All of these could be tracked in relation to temperature. It would also be very interesting to look at the effect of temperature jumps up or down. For example, switching from 33 to 37 degrees and from 37 to 33. There are also some very interesting opportunities in bioinformatics. We know that the 3D structure of RNA is always sensitive to temperature. In fact, and this is less well known, many organisms and microorganisms use so-called RNA thermometers, where temperature controls the expression of a gene by changing the conformation of RNA. Sometimes low temperature switches on a gene, other times high temperature does. This can be modeled in computer programs, and it'd be very interesting to compare the predicted RNA structures of strains of COV-2 that were isolated at different times and in places with different climates. The effect of differing RNA sequences could also be looked at in the lab, ideally using DNA-based recombinant systems, because DNA sequences are much more stable than the RNA sequences of viruses. I'm showing here several conserved features in the RNA of coronavirus, including a very well-ordered feature that is common to all coronaviruses called the S2M structure. The temperature-dependent viral tropism hypothesis also has practical implications for confining COV-2 and other infections to the upper respiratory tract and not letting it move down to the warmer lungs. Recommendations are so far based on guesswork and observation only, but it seems clear that we should keep respiratory patients continuously warm. For example, it might be very helpful just to put a small heater in the bedroom at night to prevent breathing of cold air. Some people have suggested using heat or steam inhalation to suppress the virus. However, this seems not to be the best idea. Bear in mind that at higher temperature, protein production by influenza in tissue culture increased, which of course we don't want. So increasing as well as decreasing temperature may allow the virus to move on to the next step in its life cycle. The best regime seems to be to keep temperature constant. But a trivial recommendation such as keeping the temperature of the patient constant and avoiding both hot and chill drinks have the potential to save thousands of lives. What we need here, as in the lab, are controlled experiments to find the regimes that work best in practice. So I'm hoping that we can overcome the scientific dogma that says that chilling and weather changes have no effect on respiratory illness and persuade scientists to carry out experiments that have some chance of explaining what can very easily be observed. Thank you very much for listening, and if you know anyone who would be in a position to run any of the experiments I've mentioned, please ask them to get in touch with me. I'd be very interested in planning some experiments. I already have some very limited funding, but I'm certainly looking for more. If you want to learn more about the TDVT hypothesis, please follow the links in the notes to this video. You can go to the longer video, my blog at oldwivesandvirologist.blog or read my 2016 review in Medical Hypotheses, which is much more detailed.